Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell. You'll get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And when I'm not asking Bruce, hey, how big was Batista's? Well, you know. One of the things I like to do is help people save money. And if you're watching this video right now and you're in a 30 year loan, man, you're overpaying your single biggest bill and you may not even realize it. I want you to do a little experiment for me. Take your calculator out, multiply your monthly house payment by 360 payments. That's how many payments there are in a 30 year loan. That big scary number, that's your total of payments. You're looking at that number? You know you can do better. Keep more of your own money right now and go to savewithconrad.com. Or maybe you've got credit card debt. Man, it's not a matter of if I can save you money with that. Your average interest rate on a credit card is more than 20%. And by the way, all the interest you pay on those credit cards, it's not tax deductible. Whereas the mortgage interest, well, that is tax deductible. So if you owe this debt, it's up to you how to pay it back. Doesn't it make sense to get the cheapest rate possible and the greatest tax deduction possible? Find out how much money you can save right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com. You don't need perfect credit, even scores in the 500s can be approved, and it's no cost out of pocket. But maybe best of all, we're licensed in more than 40 states. We can help more families than ever before. But how much can we save you? Find out right now for free with a quick quote from SaveWithConrad.com. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Grillin' JR with the voice of wrestling, Mr. Jim Ross. Jim, how are you, man? Man, I'm footballed out, Conrad. Um, I hit, I hit, uh, I hit my, my, my water mark, I think, this weekend. You know, we were talking before we went on the air. I got back from, uh, on two delayed flights on last week's miserable travel and coming simply from Raleigh to Charlotte and then Charlotte to Jacksonville. I had delays on every flight. Wow. And so uh, it was horrible. It really was. And I don't, you know, I, but I'm an experienced traveler, so I, I don't like a baby on it, but golly. So, uh, this week, you know, getting up as we're recording this, uh, getting ready to head to Cleveland, uh, which we ought to have a hell of a show cards. Great. Uh, and folks have already seen it. We hope you, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, but man, uh, this is going to be a hell of a show, but football was my weekend. I got back from, I got back from Raleigh dead ass tired. My leg was throbbing sitting on, uh, you know, two airplanes with all those delays and all that shit. Uh, my, my foot just was killing me. And so I never left the God dang house this week. Mm. I got back on Thursday and I, uh, I haven't left yet. I didn't go. I have, I got, I found me a girl that does, will do all my grocery shopping for me. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. I, I, I know I can do it, you know, with some sort of, you know, Publix home delivery or whatever, but she's good about, you know, I'll make a grocery list and, uh, and, and, and text it to her. So that's helped me a lot, uh, with groceries and other things and I just take pictures of what I want. It was really a cool system. And so she's the, she's actually the caretaker of Raphael Morphy's condo. So she's really been a, a, a godsend in that regard. She also got me my housekeeper, uh, Vanessa from Venezuela. <laughs> if I start talking with a Venezuelan accent, you'll know what the deal is. Yes, I will. Uh, yeah. But I don't think you have to worry about that. So anyway, I, I just, uh, I got home and, and tried to get some rest and, and control the, the pain management. Cause I just don't want to sit here and take pain pills. That just bothers the shit out of me. So, uh, anyway, that's, uh, my poor ass story. And, uh, so when I leave the house on Tuesday, more than likely it will be the first time I leave the house since, uh, I returned from the last road trip. And I'm not crazy. If anybody's got the weather channel type thing access, you know, that Cleveland's going to be miserable. And, uh, I'm sure that has, that sentence has never been made before Cleveland's weather is going to be miserable. So that's what we're doing, man. But I, I, I enjoyed, I'm a, you and I both, I think it's going to agree on the fact that we're both more college fans than we are NFL fans. 
But if the NFL could do anything more and have great games, uh, they accomplished everything on, on the weekend. And, uh, I stayed awake for all of it. I watched every game and, you know, I, I don't know. How, how do you, what's your NFL team? Do you have one or you just follow the Alabama guys? No, I don't have one, you know, big Alabama guy, but as far as a, a pro team, you know, I want to watch the stars and I want to pull for the, uh, the Alabama players, but that's really it. You know, the, yeah. the storylines kind of write themselves to me, you know, about can the bills topple the chiefs, you know, they they've looked like the right team, you know, they got hot when it mattered and all that jazz, but Patrick Mahomes is still probably the best quarterback in the league. And, uh, he did what he did. And of course, everybody has a, a Brady opinion one way or another, but what a masterful comeback it was. And then the defense rolled over and played dead and just a fun weekend full of games, you know, when, when three of the four get, uh, playoff games end with a, a walk-off field goal to win it. And then the other one goes to overtime. What more could you ask for as a football <laughs> fan? Uh, I don't think there's anything. Yeah. It was just an amazing, uh, performance by both those teams. Good coaching. I think the, uh, big mistake that Buffalo made that people are talking about is the fact that they should not have kicked the ball off deep, uh, late in the game. Yeah. Uh, and that's what I've, I've heard a lot of discussion about that, but how, how the hell do you know? I mean, you should be under control. You know, you, it's like saying, well, how much time is too much time? Well, it's just too much time when. Uh, it, that, that situation would tell, would tell you that's too much time. And so kicking the ball off on a squib kick or something along those lines, that would run some clock off. You kick it out of bounds or kick it to, to the end zone. The clock doesn't even start. The clock doesn't start until the ball is legally touched. And that means it has to be on the field of play. So, uh, that was a mistake there by Buffalo, but they got a great team. And I, I like the quarterback. Uh, I think they're going to be really good going forward. I did too. Uh, yeah, I do. And I like in my homes, those guys playing in Kansas city, Jesus, what a crowd, you know, it was just yeah. really, ama really amazing. You know, that's where a sound bar comes in handy on your TV. For me, it does. I like, I'm an audio guy. I need to hear things. It's like doing an AW show. I need to turn my levels up. So I'm motivated to be more active and more enthusiastic and all that stuff. And the sound bars is, is a big help, uh, you know, just, it just really is. So in any event, Connie, uh, I had a great football weekend and I had food here. Didn't have to go out to get it. I was, I was spoiling myself. I'm a lazy bastard, I guess. But when you can't hardly walk around, it's you do what you got to do. So, uh, you know, what's, what's funny. I, I, uh, a lot of people picked up on the fact that I was using a wheelchair in the airports and I, I, I was feeling real self-conscious about doing that. But hell, I, the time I get there and I got a bag and I'm trying to limp to the gate and all that stuff, this is a better way. So I got a, I get a, I get a wheelchair attendant, man. And they get you right from everything through the security and I'm TSA pre-check everything through security, all cool. And then, uh, take me right to the gate and it's a pretty cool deal. It's good. It's a good deal for me. It's how I have to do it right now. Yeah. But I think in the next couple of weeks, I'm going to be, uh, good Back to go. On. Yeah. Yeah. You know, some of our opportunities that we have coming up, uh, you know, I just got to make sure that I'm going to be healthy enough to fulfill my obligations. That's all I I'd, I'd love to do more things and get out of the house and see the fans and do things like that. So we'll work it out. It'll, it'll all come, come to fruition if it's meant to be. So, uh, but <clears throat> this show is going to be good. I, hey, I was, I was not really looped in and not because I was disinterested just didn't have the info in front of me more often than not of the uh, independent wrestling, uh, uh hall of business. Fame. Yeah. Yeah. The hall, hall of fame. Where was that? where did that take place? You remember? Yeah, it was in uh, New York city. It was uh, the night before GCW put on what's probably going to be the indie show of the year. Um, and, and that was on Sunday night, but Saturday night was the independent wrestling hall of fame. Jerry Lynn went in, he was inducted by Sean Waltman. Dave Prezak went in. He was inducted by CM Punk. Homicide went in. He was inducted by Chris Dickinson. Uh, Ruckus went in. He was inducted by Sanjay Dutt. Tracy Smothers went in. He was inducted by Chris Hero. And Thufisto went in, uh, inducted by Lenny Leonard. So, uh, pretty star studded affair. Really cool yeah. to see guys like Jerry Lynn and Sean Waltman, uh, you know, be able to talk about their history and, 
uh, a, a nice little event that, that Brett Lauderdale and the rest of game changer wrestling helped put together. Yeah. It sounds, uh, sound like one of those events. I wish I'd have been able to attend. Sure. Cause I love that kind of stuff. And those guys are so deserving, you know, uh, quite frankly, and Jerry Lynn's doing amazing work for AEW as a producer. He's really good with working with talent, explaining psychology and things of that nature. He's got a great, uh, demeanor. This Jerry, he's a very valuable member of our team in AEW. So he was well, des- all those guys are well deserving. And then I see where X pack X Pac, whatever. <laughs> well, Sean, Sean Walton, there you yeah, go. Sean Walton is, uh, sticking his toe back in the water a little bit. Yeah, man. I'm cool. excited to see him. You know, he's, uh, got the comeback trail, uh, on its way now, or at least I hope so for 2022. And he popped up as a little surprise, which was kind of fun last night at, uh, or a couple of nights ago, as everybody's listening to this for game changer at Hammerstein. And it's a big deal, you know, that, that he's able to have a new leash on life. Once upon a time, it looked like maybe that was uh, something in the rear view mirror, but he made the most of that opportunity and looked great. Yeah. He looks like he's in really good shape. I knew he'd be in good shape because he's got back in that workout mode and Sean's just a, a natural talent. He has great skills and timing and all those things. He didn't lose all that. No, he just had to get his mind right and his body, right. Then attack. Yep. And I think that's what, uh, Sean is looking at doing. And, you know, I, I'd love to see him have a, a big match in a W somewhere down the road or, yeah, you know, it'd be fun. For, be fun for me. I'm not seeking for Tony Khan, but, uh, I don't know where they are on all that stuff. Cause I don't get involved in that. Thank God. So, uh, I'm really, uh, I'm really happy with all those guys that got, got recognized for their hard work. Lots of times for the low pay, ridiculously miserable travel, you know, fighting to find their money, all those things. Those guys did all those things. So I'm really proud of those fellas. And it, it was, who'd you say that put the, put the event on a uh, game changer wrestling, Brett Lauderdale yeah. is the promoter of that outfit. And yeah. this Good was their, uh, them. their ECW barely legal weekend, if you will. And, uh, by all accounts, everybody who went, had a great time. And, uh, our old mutual friend, double J put his toe back in the water. I think that's his first match in like nearly three years. Huh. And, uh, it was a pretty good showing. So. Check it out at uh, fight.tv an operation. You and I are both uh, very familiar with. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I helped launch fight TV as yes, you did back, back in the day, got stock and made some money on the stock when they sold. So it was, a, uh, you know, it was one of those deals where they didn't have the money up front to pay you much. Uh, and all of a sudden they sell and you get that stock as part of your pay your compensation package. So I did good on that. I was really pleased, but I'm glad that fights are really a valuable commodity for the wrestling business. Cause if you get Wi-Fi, or whatever you want to call it, internet, whatever, if you got, if you can hook up, you can watch it, man, you can watch it anywhere. So I think that's pretty cool. Uh, quite frankly. So those guys did a good job. I'm proud of the independent fellows for all their accomplishments and what they've contributed to our business. Uh, it's been really wonderful in that respect. So, uh, and the guy we're going to talk about today, is there anything else we, on the wrestling front that we need to discuss? I don't think so. No, you know, I think, uh, you guys are coming off some, some really good shows for AEW, And of course, everybody knows what happened last night on dynamite. We got a big rampage coming up this Friday night and the beat goes on yeah. this Saturday is a Royal rumble. Uh, so as folks are hearing this, it's just a couple of days from now. And we hope if you're going to the show, you'll come see, uh, uh, Eric Bischoff, Jeff Jarrett, and myself, we've got a live show going down as a matinee effort. The same day as the Royal rumble, just two miles away from the venue, pick up your tickets now at uh, Jeff and Eric live.com and Jim, we're not recording it. So because we're not recording it, I'm hoping I can get some stories. We can't hear on the podcast out of Jeff and Eric and Talk about Vince Russo, talk about Dixie Carter, talk about Tony Khan, talk about Vince McMahon, talk about Nick Khan, some stuff that maybe we don't want, you know, just all over the wrestling news sites, but these guys should have some fun this Saturday in St. Louis. Yeah. Well, you know, they're going to grab it up at the news sites because they need clicks. (laughs) Well, they do. I mean, you know, it's just a business, right? So yeah, they need clicks. Like we need clicks, no different. And so I have no, I think, they, think that's great. And, I, and Eric 
and Jeff will be entertaining you and you adding you to the mix keeps the rudder in the water, I think. So I, I think it's going to be a, that'll be a nice project. Hope you guys do real well on that deal. I'm, I'm, I'm happy for you. So, uh, what do you think about the rumble? Who you got? Who you picking? One of those new young guys. I'm not sure. Uh, I'd say it's a great opportunity to make somebody so to speak. And if they, if they use that philosophy, uh, I'm thinking one of their, one of their young studs is going to be uh, victorious just to get fresh start, new, new winner, uh, all that. And, you know, you can, you can, we could go through all the top guys that are in it. There are tons of them <laughs> that could theoretically and realistically win the damn thing. But I think if, if I were WWE and I were Vince, this is an opportunity that I would take to make some talent. And the way that Pat Patterson designed this event is that you have these, it's almost booked in intervals. So you have spots where you, that's where you get data. Like, well, Kane eliminated 11 people. Well, you gotta, we gotta figure that out. You gotta plan that. So I'm thinking there'll be some spots in that, uh, Royal rumble where the same theory will be, uh, ongoing and there'll be some guys that have their moments. They, where they eliminate seven guys or 10 guys or five guys or whatever, or they go from one or two to the end. That would not surprise me at all. So, uh, I think it's going to be a, it should be a fun show. I hope to get a chance to take a peek at it. It is against good football. It's against football. Or isn't it? Hey folks, it's time to take your podcast game to the next level. And you certainly want to get your almighty push. My God, we have to have a push, right? Well, get that over to adfreeshows.com. Now, I'm telling you, if you're a fan of Grilling JR, adfreeshows.com has the entire episode library, and it's got no ads, zero ads, zilf, none. Ad free and on video starting at just nine bucks. Did you hear what I, what I said? Nine dollars. You spend more than that at Starbucks, for God's sakes. Two mornings. If that's not all, folks, we've got tons of bonus content, including my after hours round table where drinking was involved with Eric and Tony. You simply will not find a better value in all of wrestling. Hey, look, don't make me go red ass because by God, you know I will. Hurry over to adfreeshows.com right now and sign up. And I thank you. Thank you. No, I, I think um, I, I'll be honest. I'm not even sure. I thought both games were Sunday, but let's take a look right oh, now. Oh, you might be right about that. I think you are right about that. <laughs> let's see. Yeah, it looks like uh, they're both on Sunday, so we'll have a, a yeah a, a, a <laughs> wrestling day, if you will. So pick up your tickets now to come see uh, Jeff and Eric at uh, Jeff and Eric Live dot com, and then tune in to Peacock. Uh, or hey, they may still have tickets on sale for St. Louis, but. As for me, I'm going to pick Big E on the guy side. I think Big E is it, it's pr probably time for him to have a, his moment in the sun. And on the women's side, I think it gets a little interesting. You know, they've announced something they don't normally do. Mickey James, who is the champion of of another promotion, is going to be inside of it, which could be fun. But there's lots of rumors out there, you know, that, uh, maybe somebody's coming back for this. And no, I'm not talking about the Bellas. I've heard a lot of fans say they think Ronda Rousey is going to win and Ronda Rousey hasn't even been announced for this. I know she had a baby last year. I don't know if that's out of the realm of possibility, but I guess anything can happen here in the world wrestling federation, <laughs> especially in the WrestleMania season. Would you be surprised to see Ronda Rousey come back? Yeah, I would pleasantly. As well, you know, uh, I see where Trish Stratus has really been working out hard. Oh, wow. She looks really, really good. So depending on the number she drew, it might be plausible and realistic for her to get a late entrant mm. and win the damn thing. Uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't, it's who needs to be made. Right. And Trish doesn't need to be made. She's already made, but it's just for the sake of story writing. It certainly would be surprising. And interesting, uh, is she got in the final four, let's say that would not surprise me, but I don't know about this, uh, uh, you know, the Charlotte and, uh, Becky are their two top stars. I think that's what I would say. Yeah, I would agree. Is that close? And, uh, so 
but I don't think either will win it because I don't think either needs to. Well, no, I think they're both toting titles too. So I, I think if it's somebody who's, who's on the WWE roster, I'd probably go with Sasha Banks. And again, I'm not even sure that she's been announced, but her coming out, as, even as a surprise, you know, the crowd's going to just eat that up. Yeah. But if they're looking for a, a mainstream attraction, you got to think Ronda Rousey oh. is going to want to be in a title match. That's going to be like, she's hard. Brock Lesnar, man. Yeah. Yeah. She's Brock Lesnar without testicles. <laughs> and she's the baddest bitch on the planet. Let me tell you, uh, I love her and her husband, not good people. They're really, really good people. And, uh, and you know, she'll be in shape. She would not show herself in public if she weren't in fighting shape. Agree to a large degree. That's she's just a proud athlete. That's not going to show up looking like uh, she just had a baby. That's just, I don't see that happening, but boy, it's an intriguing, uh, uh idea, you, you know, idea, but it's an in interesting concept you have regarding, uh, Rhonda and she'd mean, a, she'd mean an awful lot. I just, here's what I, one of my pet peeves about things like that is with kayfabe, the promotion sometimes and all promotions to some degree kayfabe themselves by not advertising their full hand. I do understand the element of surprise and how important that is within pro wrestling. Uh, and it is, it is, it's always been that way. And it's always going to stay that way. People like surprises, but you don't want to kayfabe yourself. In other words, I don't have a problem with Ronda Rousey being a surprise, but also wonder how much of marketing value you're losing by kayfabing the audience that she's going to be there. So that's just a marketing thought. I might be wrong as hell about that, but that's, I just don't understand, uh, K faving some of your biggest stars <clears throat> and there's no star in the female wrestling women's wrestling than Ronda Rousey. She's a star. She's Brock Lesnar of her gender without a doubt. So it all, it all to be fun. Uh, it all, it'll, it'll be a fun show. I'm sure it was my favorite show to broadcast even over WrestleMania. I like doing WrestleMania when it was Lawler and I. Uh, two men booth, so to speak, but yeah, I, I, I'm not real big on, uh, uh, I wasn't real big when we started adding the SmackDown announcers and then this guest announcer, it started getting watered down in my view and that just being my massive ego speaking. Uh, so, but I, I, I had some WrestleMania that I dearly love and still thought to think about them from time to time, but nothing was more fun than actually when the the Royal rumble match started because it was nonstop. You know, uh, they always gave us a list, uh, of, uh, who's coming out next. And I rarely looked at it. I saw no value in knowing who's coming out seventh right. or ninth or whatever. Well, I don't need to know that quite frankly. So that's, uh, I, I like that element of surprise. And then when you got in the ring, <laughs> you never knew what was going to happen. You know, somebody's going to get a run. Somebody's going to hit a string of stream of, uh, uh, eliminations. So it's a, it's pretty cool in that regard. I was, like I said, it was one of my favorite events. W one of the more memorable ones was I worked a Royal Rumble with Taz and he was getting a break. Uh, and, uh, he was on SmackDown. They moved him in with me. Uh, I don't remember what, even what year it was. So, uh, but he was very nervous as we all are before a big show, but he had never got the chance to do uh, anything like that. And that's that match, you know, is going to go at least an hour. So you got to settle in and, and keep your shit together and, 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 uh, and just connect all the dots that are coming at you pretty quick, like every 90 seconds or something. <laughs> so, uh, that was a, that was a memorable one, but I, I enjoyed the, the rumbles were really good. And then, you know, Austin had that run where he hit, he won three in a row. It was unbelievable. I mean, was it three in a row? He won, he won three. Yeah. But in any event, that was an interesting time. That was an interesting philosophy and it worked and it got him over and helped to get him over and off we went. So good stuff. I hope they do well in the rumble. I, I'm for people. So how can you, they're the enemy. They're not my enemy. WWE is not my enemy. Uh, and they shouldn't be your enemy. They That's shouldn't not silly. That's just silly. It is. It's childish and immature and amateur hour. Why would you, 
wish ill will on another wrestling company when you're a wrestling fan. I don't understand that. So in any event, uh, one thing I do understand is Bret Hart because I still keep in contact with him and he's one of the first to step up when I had skin cancer and uh, encouraged me to not give up the fight. And, uh, I always, one of the highlights of my day, this may sound really childish Conrad, uh, was when, uh, when I get a text from Brett, how you feeling hanging in there? I knew you'd, when I announced I cancer free, he was one of the first guys to text me and, uh, and congratulate me. And that meant a lot to me. So like I said, uh, that's a respect that he has earned and deservedly. So, uh, it's just been, that's been a blessing in my life in a lot of ways as, as Brett. <clears throat> and I don't know how you say who's the best in ring performer of all time. I don't know what that criteria is, but if you're talking about the best in ring performer of all time, if Brett Hart isn't in that conversation, then we're, I think we're looking at it wrongly. He I has to agree. be considered, has to be considered. Look at those major matches he had and, and, and what we also don't taking into consideration, I don't think enough is how important Brett was to making Stone Cold Steve Austin, the biggest star in the world. No doubt. So cool stuff, man. So this ought, this ought to be a hell of a show here. Well, let's jump into it, man. We're talking about maybe his biggest year ever. It's certainly my favorite year he had 1997 and, and, um, 96 as a reminder closes out with the build for Sid and Shawn Michaels at the Royal rumble. And a lot of people are assuming that we're on a collision course, that it's going to be Brett and Sean for our rematch at WrestleMania 13. Is that sort of the way you always imagined WrestleMania 13 would, would go? That was the original plan, a rematch from 96 with Brett and Sean. Yeah, that would, uh, have not surprised me. I think it'd been logical booking. They had an ongoing story, uh, that always, it seemed to have a uh, sometimes less than happy ending, depending on your persuasion. Uh, but it was an untold story. It was an unfinished story. So I, I was, that was kind of what I was thinking. And ironically, if they had wrestled, I'm sure they would have stolen the show at WrestleMania 13. If, but the issue is Brett still stole the show working with Austin. That was one of the best matches I've, I've seen, uh, us have at WrestleMania. It was believable, uh, just simply a piece of art and it, it put stone cold on the map. In my view, no doubt about it. And we know that we uh, are going to get my favorite match of all time, uh, with Brett at WrestleMania 13. So I'm not upset that he didn't get to wrestle Sean, but Brett wrote in his book, he doesn't really know where his character was going at the time. Um, and we know that 1997 is going to be a year where we try something totally different. Red Hart, not only as a heel, but really as a heel, just in America, right. But a baby face everywhere else. And that was really uncharted territory, but it, it's interesting as 96 comes to a close. And we've covered a lot of those big moments and matches. You know, he has this classic with stone cold and his return at survivor series. And it looks like, you know, he's going to be in a prime spot for the Royal rumble. But even he isn't really sure because I think a lot of guys, especially in that era, take a look at the baby face side of things and take a look at the heel side of things. Yeah. And in their mind, they've got to reconcile. Am I the number one heel? Am I the number two baby face? <laughs> that yeah. sort of thing. Wrestlers oh, yeah. think like that a lot. So I would get with Sean being positioned as a baby face and the hometown hero as we head to the Royal Rumble. Austin probably feels like. Hey, even though people are cheering this badass stone cold, Steve Austin character, he's really wrestling like a heel. I'm wrestling like a baby face. So maybe I'm the number two baby face behind Sean. Would that be fair to say? Probably. Yeah. Uh, I think there's a lot of uncertainty and, uh, be honest with you, a lack of communication on all the upper echelon decision makers part. Uh, at least that's my, my take on it. But yeah. I, I would say. You know, Brett wanted to be the number one guy. A lot, a lot of fans today will still argue that he was, I'm not going to disagree with that philosophy, but, uh, we didn't all know. And all I knew is, is that when it, 
you could feel something special when Brett Austin, uh, hooked up. It just, that was, this is going to be their night. You just had a gut. I had a gut feeling. It's just going to be something really extraordinary <clears throat> and they delivered. It was extraordinary. And it was a, it was the best match. I thought it was the best match on the card. We just recently covered, uh, Royal rumble 97. So if you haven't heard that, go listen to it in the archives, but I want to mention the night after the rumble, uh, Brett is going to open the show and start berating Vince McMahon at ringside. It's one of the first times that it's ever acknowledged on TV that Vince is the owner of the WWF, but Brett is really just going to go on and on about how he's been screwed by everyone, including Shawn Michaels. At this point, this is before Sean quote unquote, lost his smile. And we'll get to that in a moment that happened in February, but here on January 20th, 1997 with, all, with, with Brett complaining that he had been screwed in the Royal rumble. Of course, as we covered in the archives, stone cold was eliminated, but he snuck back in because the referee didn't see it. And Austin declared the winner. It probably rightfully should have been Brett, or at least he would have been in the conversation. But when he's complaining like this on TV, oh, everyone screwed me, et cetera, et cetera. It feels as if we're no longer hoping that it's going to be a baby face versus a baby face at, at, at WrestleMania. This almost feels like a, a heel crying about sour grapes. Do you think that was the original plan or, or was it supposed to just be still baby faces and either you were a true blue died in the wool Bret Hart fan or a Sean fan? I think it was just uh, felt at the time that Brett needed a, another edge, another, another tweak in his armor, a uh, new coat of paint, a new hold as I get kidded about all the time. Sure. Uh, you know, so, uh, I just think it was a way to, uh, sharpen the blade a little bit for Brett and, uh, but he was just, the change helped him. I think, you know, it made him a bigger star in Canada and around the world. And that was a big marketplace for the, for WWE in those years still is, I'm assuming, uh, when they can travel with, the, with all the COVID issues, but he's, uh, I think it was something he needed and he, he kind of liked it. Uh, he liked the respect that he liked you know, when he went to Canada in that era, it was like the good Lord stepped in the ring. They loved him. He was the most popular guy. Maybe the most popular athlete in that era in the whole country. Uh, so, uh, I think it was timely and it gave him, uh, another cause to give him a, and some of the things, here's the thing about a great promo, Connie, is that he was telling the truth on a lot of things. Absolutely. And so that's the thing about, uh, our business is dang, man. Uh, when you tell an audience the truth. Sometimes they can't handle the truth and they react accordingly. So I thought it was a good move creatively. And, uh, it just kept that, that picture at the top of the chart, uh, still a little cloudy. Who's, who are we going to cheer for? Who's, uh, I'm, I just think it became a more interesting story because it's, it was seated in realism. And when you got a quote unquote heel, that is, uh, telling you that you're telling the truth and you don't want to hear it. Those are sometimes your very, very best promos. So let's talk about the, the revelation, at least in public that, um, Vince is the owner that's never really been acknowledged on WWE programming up to this point. Uh, as a reminder, he's still sitting at the desk alongside yourself. Do you remember there being significant conversation about whether or not that should be revealed? Was Vince hesitant or did he just think, Hey, this will be, this is great shit, pal. And that was all there was. I think, uh, it was Vince's decision. He blessed it. I'm sure Brett had a hand in the idea of how to handle it. And, uh, I don't know if he gave Vince the idea, but he certainly endorsed the idea because it fit to a T his his, uh, what he was, what Brett was shooting for. Uh, but I, I think it was, we were not the, the announcers were not, uh, uh, informed of what was happening in that respect. In other words, I think Vince had enough trust in Lawler and I to, uh, or is that Lawler and me? I don't know, whatever. Uh, I think Lawler and me actually, 
but I've never been a wordsmith. But I, I think that uh, no, I, I think that uh, it was it was a uh, it fit. It made sense at that time. It added another wrinkle to the to the uh, recipe. So uh, I, I I all I know is that when they were talking about that and we're on TV and it was here we go. I wasn't prepared. I had no material prepared. How are you going to respond, Jr.? How are you going to act? You know, that's the worst question to ask me. How are you going to act? Hell, I don't know. Uh, I'll act accordingly, but I didn't. I didn't have a clue as to what they were going to do. But it worked, and that's all that matters. So um, at this point, I guess I want to know, at least in your mind's eye, are Sean and Brett on the same page? Is it evident to you that there's you know, trouble between the two, or did you just assume now business as usual, just guys handling business? Well, I, uh, I think they were trying to get to, to a meeting place so they could finish their business. Uh, but I don't want to ever say that they were best buddies. I, I know they reconciled as Tony Soprano would say, uh, they reconciled later on which was, which was, uh, helpful and good. But at that point in time, they weren't, they weren't the best buddies. They weren't going to ride together. You didn't see them sitting at the same table at catering. It just didn't happen. Right. So that that's where we were with that deal, man. It just, they had a respectful, they kept a respectful distance from each other so that the, their emotions and all these latent issues, uh, didn't didn't, uh, rear their head again. So, but I don't think they were ever best buddies until they finally made up. So let's, uh, keep everyone in the loop here. Of course, because of the way things ended at the Royal rumble, they're going to decide to do the February in your house show from Chattanooga as what they're going to call the final four, putting back into the ring, the final four competitors for the Royal rumble, just to extend that storyline and decide who will really be the number one contender, who will get a title shot at WrestleMania. And the final four were Bret Hart, Stone Cold Steve Austin, Big Van Vader, and The Undertaker. And I, I kind of like that. Pretty good quartet, Connie. Yeah, great group of folks. It's top guys. And, and really, the WWF has always had, and I still I still think they do a lot of times, and more even in more modern years, there's almost like a lame duck pay-per-view. They used to call it fast lane a few years ago, but between Royal rumble and WrestleMania, that one in between often feels like a throwaway. So not having a definitive Royal rumble winner, you're going to have that hot issue, you know, settled at a pay-per-view next month. And then we're ready for WrestleMania. That actually works for me. I think this might be my favorite February pay-per-view that the WWF put on. It was good booking yeah. and it was timely. And it was logical. The, the final four, the four guys are left in the Royal Rumble. They get a reprieve. They get a second chance to to make it there. So if you're a Bret Hart fan, that's good news. If you're a Stone Cold fan, you're loving this, and you don't want to ever count out the Undertaker in any environment. And then you br- bring in the Monster Heel. And what it also does, Conrad, is it gives you the potential to have some great TV matches or house show matches, whatever, uh, with those four guys, it creates marriages, it creates issues. So who's going to bitch if you come out with a program with undertaker and invader, who's going to bitch if you got the stone cold invader. So, uh, and then you got that Bret Hart element, Bret Hart had the most emotional following that made all that really accelerate in my, in my opinion. So, cause he had a, he, had, he was telling us an emotional story that was based in fact. And, uh, so I think that added so much to the, you know, you talk about that final four thing. I don't even remember who else was on the card. Right. I, I remember that match and it's also where I, we saw China debut for what it's worth. She ragged really? all Marlena at ringside from the other <laughs> side of the barricade. Pretty fun little moment. Yeah, I remember that. I do, I do remember that. Yeah. Uh, that was, she got shake, rattle, and rolled for uh, Terry. 
she looked so small too in China's arms. That, that was good booking. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, it was one match show essentially. And it, and I thought, I don't know what, what it did my, by rate wise, but it was a, it was a, that was the attraction that sold, that sold all the fruit. So we're going to cover the big raw from the sky dome next week. We're actually going to do a watch along and that's where Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels are going to have a confrontation and it happens in Canada. It's one of the biggest Monday night Raws ever to that point. We'll talk about it in our watch along next week. So stay tuned for that. Uh, but on upcoming house show booking sheets for Buffalo, Cleveland, and Detroit, the main event is listed as Sid and Brett teaming up to take on Steve Austin and Shawn Michaels. That's interesting. I mean, thank you. There's no cut and dry. <laughs> who's a good guy. Who's a bad guy. Steve Austin, while he is getting some cheers, wrestles like a heel, right? Red Hart is a traditional baby face. Who's been screwed over. Sid is a heel. Sean is a baby face. This starts to feel like the shades of gray era. Is yeah. that fair to say? Yeah, it is. And I'm not against that. I understand there's a lot of my, uh, contemporaries, a lot of, a lot of old vets and stuff that believe that the heel baby face concept must always be in place to have a successful con match presentation. Uh, but what I, when I booked those cards, it was, uh, it, we, we, we were tying stories together. In other words, there was a, there was a marriage there, uh, whether baby faces or their heels, they all had an issue with each other in some form or fashion. So that's why I thought it would work. And I think it did work. I'm curious what you think of this. This is uh, directly from, well, I'm not going to read a quote, but it's, it's written in Brett's book that Steve Austin came to him to tell him that Sean and Hunter had told Steve that Brett refused to put Steve over. And of course, Brett denies that says that didn't happen. And then later that night at a house show in Ottawa. So we're in Canada. Pat Patterson approaches Brett and asks him to put Hunter over to show the boys. And the amount of distrust and issues going on in the locker room here in early 97 goes back to what you've said a lot here on the program, Jim, that you want a locker room of reliable guys. You want a locker room full of team players, right? In your opinion, were Sean and Hunter team players here in early 97, uh, it'd be hard to say that they were. Yeah. Uh, they had their own personal agendas. They both had the ear of the old man. Uh, and you know, Vince loved Sean, like he was a son. He loved Sean more than I think he loved triple H who was courting his daughter. Uh, so, but Pat, I don't know if Pat did that as on his own or he consulted with Vince. And that was a game plan they came up with. I think in hindsight, it was not a good idea to advocate that. And for the life of me, and I'm as this may be being a, a naive old dude, uh, I just have a hard time believing that Bret Hart would say, I'm not going to put Austin over Brett was smart. Brett knew where he, he, where he was, he knew where the issue was. Uh, but that's just not the businessman that Bret Hart is. It's just not. So, uh, but again, I wasn't, I wasn't in that conversation, but when I, but I hear, I heard about it. I talked to Austin every day. He said, what do you think? I said, I don't think it happened between you and me. I don't think it happened. And I probably shouldn't have said that in my role, but, but I, I, I have this theory of being honest with the talent. Nothing wrong and with some, that. Yeah. And sometimes you tell them things that they don't want to hear, but at least you're being truthful as best you can. So that's kind of where I was on that deal. I never believed that Brett would say, I'm not putting Austin over. That's just. That's way beyond his character. And I just don't think he would have done that. That's just me. And again, I may be the most naive dude in the world, but it just didn't make any sense to me. So then Brett reaches out to Vince, uh, to discuss all of this, you know, backstage maneuvering. And in that conversation, Vince drops a bomb on him. Sid's going to go over Sean on Thursday, raw Thursday to win the title with some help from Brett Hart. And now it'll be Taker versus Sid in the main event with Brett and Sean underneath. And Vince is trying to explain to Brett that it's too predictable. And that's why it's being changed. And Brett in his book speculates that in his opinion, it's because Sean just didn't want to put Brett over. What do you think the truth is? Do you think that Vince had convinced himself that 
It was too predictable to have a title match in the main event of WrestleMania 13. That was just like the one at 16, Brett and Sean, or is this perhaps a little, uh, chess playing by Mr. Michaels? Well, Sean was a notorious chess player, <laughs> say, say the least. And he knew he had the stroke because he had Vince's ear and anything Sean wanted to get done. or wanted to, to a message. He had no, he had no filters to go through. He had complete and clear access right through the door of Vince's office at wherever we were. So, uh, I, I, it's hard to say, I mean, you can make an argument for either of those concepts and those theories. Uh, I just don't think Brett was, or excuse me, Sean was ready emotionally, uh, to do the, do the honors. And he convinced Vince that wasn't a thing to do. And Vince bought that story and. But, but you got to hand it to Sean. At least he was in front of Vince trying to plead his case. Uh, as all guys do, this was just more famous than others. So, so I don't know, man, I, I, I'm not sure what the motivation was other than I believe that, uh, Brett was just not, in, or excuse me, Sean was just not in a mental position, a, phys, a mental state to say, okay, let's do what you, let's do this. I'll, I'll put him over. Because that was the whole crux of the whole issue for whatever reason, Sean just didn't want to put bread over. And I, and, and I, for the life of me, when you can be booked with a guy, that's as great as Sean, as great as, uh, Bret Hart was, why would you not take that match? You're going to look great, right? You know, Brett's going to make you look like a million dollars. And so you slip on the banana peel and he gets a quick one, two, three. That's how I would look at it. But, uh, I'm not Sean and I'm not wearing his boots and, or his tights. Thank God for all the children there, there. So, uh, I'm just not a sexy boy, Conrad. <laughs> so, uh, but I, I don't, there's so many mind games at play and so many different elements floating around out there. You got the Austin element. What about taker? Uh, you know, I don't know that taker wanted to work with Sid. They didn't, they didn't have a great match. As I recall, am I wrong? No, you're not. And supposedly Sid shit his pants. We'll talk about that another time. Uh, <laughs> it, ah, Vince will love that. Vince, that JR bonus, uh, said he shit himself. <laughs> <laughs> so the expectation, or, or I guess what people sort of say in hindsight is that Sean just didn't want to do the job here to Sid. So he came up with the knee injury. Uh, to get out of doing that job and the job to Brett at WrestleMania. At least that's what wrestling fans think. The observer would write this. Michael's career was teased as being over due to a knee injury portrayed on television Thursday as being so bad. Even reconstructive surgery may not be able to repair the damage as a teary eyed Sean, whose problem was clearly in the interview, not a knee injury said farewell to the WWF in a classic interview that was repeated to death on television and pay-per-view about a hundred times in the ensuing weekend. It wound up only to have noted orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Jim Andrews say Michael's knee injury wouldn't require surgery at all, just four to six weeks of rehab. And he'd be able to return at press time. It appears the plan is for Michael's to now be put back into the WrestleMania mix. Although not as a wrestler, perhaps doing announcing or as a special guest referee, but he will wrestle a few major shows during the summer and then return full-time in the fall. When you go back and you think about that whole lost my smile promo, what can you tell us about that day? What do you remember? You show up to the building. You think we're going to have Sean and Sid. You're probably hearing, oh, I've been on the phone with Sean and he says, we got big problems, but. I'm sure you think, oh, the old man will handle it. We'll get, we'll get the match in the ring. He always does. Yeah. But then your ringside is you see Vince holding the microphone and Sean trying to pour his heart out. And a lot of fans at home saying, mm, I don't know about this. What say you, it didn't come off as truthful. I think that's the bottom line. Yeah. Whereas as we discussed, Brett's promos came off as truthful, even though he was bitching and moaning and complaining a la a heel in the land of America. Uh, you know, I, I just thought that that I knew that day was going to be special because, you know, Vince did smarten me up about here's where we are. And I got, we got this little dilemma and, uh, Sean's going to retire or relinquish the title. That's a big deal. Yeah, it is. 
a big deal, man. And, uh, and Vince, uh, he, he did get the match in the ring, so to speak. But I, I don't think the audience bought the, I lost my smile thing. I thought it was a clever line, uh, but it just didn't come off as genuine. And I think that's kind of what hurt it. So Brett writes in his book that taker, uh, told Brett that night when they find out that Sean didn't want to drop the belt. Um, how quickly do you think all this changed from, from the live Thursday raw to the pay-per-view and final four? You know, now you've got three days to promote another live raw on Monday. There's a lot of moving pieces here. So just to catch you up here, it's Thursday when Sean relinquishes the title on Sunday, we've got a final four that was originally designed, uh, to go ahead and have a number one contender. Now it's to crown a new champion. Yeah. And we're going to go with Brett. And Brett wins that match. It's an incredible match. Final four. They get plenty of time Four and a, and a quarter stars. Vader bleeds buckets. People still talk about that as one of the better four ways on pay-per-view maybe ever. Yeah. And Brett's our new champ, but the next night on raw, he's going to lose it to Sid. There's a lot of, uh, maneuvering yeah. that has to happen to get this belt where we think we want it for WrestleMania. What did you think of Vince's creative here? Well, I thought that, uh, we're, we just, we started to devalue the championship the quick turnaround, you know, wins it, loses it that thing for Brett. Uh, I was surprised that he, he went for it. Uh, and he did. That's what makes, gives me the, the validation for the lack of a better term that Brett was refusing to put over Austin. God dang. He put over Sid. Right. And I know that Brett had a, a, a lot more of a relationship based on respect and so forth. Uh, nothing didn't respect Sid, but I know what Brett thought of Austin. He thought Austin was going to be the next big thing. So I don't know, Connie, I, I, I thought we started to diminish. I knew that we're going to be in store for building a rebuilding our title. And, uh, it, it, like you said, the moving parts line certainly fits. Uh, it was just, it was a little challenging and, uh, and the, the psychological aspect of my job at that time to answer questions and try to keep town unhappy that we're doing the right thing and just bear with us, just do your job, work your ass off, you know, and, and uh, and things are going to work out. That's all I could tell the talent. Cause that's all I knew. I told them the truth. I told them the truth. I just, I, but I, I didn't have the answer to say, <clears throat> well, here's what we're going to do. Bing, bing, bing. This will happen. Then this will happen. And we didn't know. I didn't know that. None of us knew that. Only the person that knew what he was going to do at the end of the day was, was Vince. And he wasn't sharing that with a lot of people. It's uh it's interesting to think about the timeline of when Vince came up with all that. And I often wonder if he came up with all that the afternoon there in Lowell mass, but somehow I doubt it. Um, really an amazing match at final four, uh, go out of your way to see it. And, and Meltzer would, would say it's basically a battle Royal as no one gets pinned. Um, do you remember there being a time when all of this is happening and there's this, all the, the backstage maneuvering that Brett maybe confides in you or somebody else. And, and it gets back to you. Hey, I think Sean's full of shit. <laughs> yeah. He's a, he had those sentiments from time to time. Okay. Um, Sean also wrote in his book that if Vince pushed Sean to put Brett over at mania, he would, do you believe that? Do you think Sean would have done the honors for Brett at WrestleMania or was it already contentious to the point that that just wasn't going to happen at 13? Well, that's a hard one to answer. Uh, one would hope and one would, I would, I would say from my own peace of mind that Sean would have kept his word and, and kept Vince's word. Vince, I want you to put him over. I need a yes or no. And you got a yes, then we're moving on. You got to know, we got to do some more creative work, but Sean was challenging in this, uh, in, in that, in that respect and all the backstage shit with Hunter and Sean didn't help the matters at all. It's like they were, they had a, uh, a prison sentence awaiting them and they, you know, you're going to go to jail. 
whether you like it or not, you've been convicted and here's your, here's your sentence. So, uh, I, I think Vince, I think Sean would have done what Vince wanted at the end of the day. He's not going to kill the golden golden goose that he has the goose's ear. Why are you going to alienate your, the, the decision maker, the decision maker, not a committee guy or what have you, but the guy. So, uh, I think Sean would have fulfilled his obligation in that respect, but he would have done it reluctantly. And, uh, because again, that, that personal issue outside the ring shit, uh, was not going to go away. This wasn't. So the night after the final four, we would see Brett work said in the main event of raw, he's going to drop the title to him in Nashville. And this is the show where Brett debuts something that people are still talking about and using to this day, the figure four leg lock around the ring post, Jim, it's been said a lot, man, there's nothing original in wrestling. There's nothing new in wrestling. This is the first time I've ever seen that. This is a pretty innovative spot by the Hitman here, is it not? Yeah, me too. I'd never seen it before in all my territory years, the WCW years, the Cowboy Bill Watch years. I never saw it. So it's brand new to me. And that was just Brett's creativity. Uh and, and if you looked at it, how we tried to tell the story, you got a real long legged six to nine uh challenger and Sid. And you got to destroy a vertical base of a guy that's that large. You got to get him down. And so using the ring post as a surrogate, so to speak, uh, was logical. The only thing that you had to use creative license for, I, I think was the fact that the referee's got to be very, uh, judicious and not count too fast, not get involved in this count too fast because you get, you know, you got a four count and you don't break on five, you're, you're, you're out of the game. You're disqualified and that's not going to help anybody. So that was the only thing, little thing that I could see and the referees were good. and They understood the concept. So, uh, but I thought that was a pretty cool thing too. I'm with you. Was, I'd never seen it before. And, and, and when I started processing what I was seeing, I could tell a story that made sense. He's trying to destroy the legs of the, of the six, nine guy. And if you can, if Sid can, if Sid is broken down and put on the mat, Brett's got him. This is Brett Hart's match now. Oh, come on, Jim. You were saying Brett's trying to destroy Sid's vertical base. Vertical base is a Jim Rossism I'll use forever. I, uh, I, I love that match. I love this storyline and, uh, having you guys on the call and, and all the hype of knowing and the pressure that this is WrestleMania season made it really fun. The story is Sid gets the win with the power bomb. After Austin hits Brett with a chair, Sid's there a sharpshooter. Now we're set for mania. It's going to be Sid versus taker, uh, and Brett versus Austin. And, uh, Brett's going to head on to a European tour here. Now, Sean is not a part of it. Remember he's lost his smile. So maybe this is a welcome break from all the stress and nonsense for Brett, but ultimately it winds up being Brett's last European tour with the company. Is there a way to really put into words, how important Brett is to the European market and the impact he had on it. Well, Brett Hart was the biggest star we had uh, in Europe. Yeah. And, and, and until Austin got really hot, uh, Brett was still in that position. He just had a kinship and a connection, uh, with the audience in, in Europe, Canada, other places. Uh, I don't know what, what the charm was for sure, but he had great respect for the, uh, for the audience. They loved him. He, he represented something they could understand. He was a good guy. He was a hell of a wrestler who had been wronged and they got it. It was a simple, simple story of, uh, how you, how you react in, in certain situations. He never let the fans down. He always had great matches, but he was the guy. He was the guy over Sean. He was the guy over Hunter. He was the guy over Austin in that era, uh, on the international side of business. He made a huge difference in the bottom line. So we know that, uh, we are going to get Brett across the pond one more time, but it really is for one night only for the one night only show in September, but still it's, it's weird to think about his last European tour here being even before WrestleMania. 
Now, Brett has always talked about how, you know, he never refused to put anybody over, but he even wrote in his book about this first raw from Europe and how Jerry Briscoe tells Brett, he wants him to lose to Hunter and Brett questions it because he says, Hey, if we're building to, to me and Austin for mania, does it make sense for me to lose here? Brett takes this issue to Vince and Vince changes it to a DQ. You know, I gotta say, I'm kind of with Brett here. This doesn't make sense for, for if we're, if we're really trying to get some steam on a non-title match at WrestleMania, why would he lose to Hunter here? Makes no sense. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't, uh, suggest that finish. Uh, you know, I'm not a big on the DQs. Uh, I think we can be more creative if, even in today's marketplace. And I think that's one of the great things about AEW is that Tony Khan doesn't wear out a DQ finish, right? We don't have many. He's smart enough to book winners and losers and the talent understand that that's what Tony's, uh, goal is to have winners and losers. And, uh, so they, they, they create ways to lose if they're losing, they create ways to win if they're winning so they can make sure, make, maintain, uh, uh, a return or can, can make, you know, this, it just makes more sense. It's more realistic. And we, the, the, our pro wrestling business is spoiled of fans with, I don't know if they spoiled them. I think they only, they, they shit on them a little bit by having a DQ cause they can't politically come to terms with the talents involved on somebody to lose a fictitious con, uh, match. I don't get that. If you're a good enough worker, Conrad, you should be able, if you're really, really good, you should be able to figure out how to lose and how to win and, and, and maintain both sides of this equation. So if you're winning, you want to do all you can to enhance the loser, right? So your win has quality and it's, it's, a, it's a significant, uh, but I, I never thought that would, that was, a, I don't understand why we were even well, uh, the DQ I would go for. And I did. Not that I had to, but nobody asked me to, to agree with it, just to get it done. So I, I, uh, I don't know, man. I, I think I, I was, it was one of the most stressful times in my career because the guys involved by and large were great pros, good guys that I enjoy being around and nobody likes to be around people that are seemingly permanently unhappy. It's just a downer. And it's also, uh, childish and amateur hour. Uh, cause I didn't, I wasn't raised in that. The, you know, cowboy bill Watts came in to give a finish. It wasn't a situation. We're going to go into a room and negotiate. It did the finishes in front of everybody. So if a guy, if you and me are wrestling and I got, I got to put you over, uh, he's going to make sure that the, the, the boys know this is what we're going to do. And Jr. you're putting Conrad over hey, with his finish at 10 minutes. Okay. And so that's how he worked. And there wasn't a good, now I'm sure there were negotiations from time to time, but cowboy knew how to maintain his uh, bread and butter. I E junkyard dog in that era back in the day. Uh, so it watched rent a different locker room. The talent had more. The talent in that area we're talking about right now had more stroke. If that's a good word, I don't know if it is more influence than talents that preceded them. And, uh, that became very problematic. So let's talk about, uh, March 9th Springfield is where it all changes. Brett has a meeting with Vince and they talk about this in Brett's book. He describes how Vince is selling him on a program with Steve Austin that ultimately will revolve around Austin turning babyface, but Brett will become a heel. And Vince tells Brett he'll be working as a heel. And that means he could wrestle The Undertaker, Shawn Michaels, and Steve Austin. And then Vince throws in the kicker he'll be a babyface in every other country and only a heel in America. Now that actually makes sense. If you're Bret Hart and you're taking a look at, cause if you're a baby face, you want to know, all right, who can I have matches with on the other side of the aisle and vice versa. So knowing, all right, well, this way I could have matches with Taker, Austin and Michaels and yeah, why not? I, I like that idea, but the twist of 
well, now you're a heel here, but a baby face everywhere else. I don't think this has ever really been done like this before. We're used to, okay, uh, yeah. regardless of good guy or bad guy, if, if you're from here, if this is your hometown, then we're going to cheer you. But now we're going to make it where, you know, you only have one, one away game, if you will. And that's uh, America, all of the other continents and countries and what have you, you're still going to be beloved. Is this a McMahon idea, a Russo idea? How does this come to be the first time you hear of it? Who do you remember bringing that up? I think that was a Vince idea. Okay. Uh, and, and all of us agreed with that deal, Conrad. We were not going to turn Brett heel. He get booed in Canada and, and, and Europe, Germany yeah. and yeah. England and all that. That's not going to happen. So it was, it wasn't like it was a, a, this brilliant booking creative thing. The thing it was is that we all had to agree and, and get on the same page that, that Brett was beloved everywhere, but America. And that he's, he's all, all he's doing is enhancing his star capacity. So uh, to me, it was just logical. Uh, and I, and I understand it was, uh, also untraditional, non-traditional, but I didn't think that hurt us. It was freshening up the product a little bit and building a heel via a personal issue. And you've heard me on this, uh, on our podcast, many times, personal issues are far out draw titles. I mean, I, I, it's been so long cause there's so many title changes. Uh, it seems to me like anyway, just my opinion in the business in general, that sometimes we, we inadvertently devalue our titles and, uh, too many title changes, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, I, I thought that made sense and I thought it was a nice, it, it was a, uh, here's the other thing about that. You also got the same basic concept with Davy and, and Owen. Cause you got two more heels. Yeah. That you hadn't planned on. Uh, so, and some of those Canadian kids actually got noticed, you know, they got people starting to pay attention a little bit when they weren't. So, and all because of their maybe second or third cousin relationship to Brett. So it did more for the roster than it just did for Brett Hart. And I thought that was a good thing. It gave them relevance. And, uh, and, and something significant to build upon, build upon. I want to mention that, um, Brett was hesitant to do it uh, or so he writes in his book, but ultimately he agreed. And then Vince goes down or, or goes over rather how he wants the, the double turn to go down. And really in hindsight, just a, a creative genius here in the moment. And I know people like to criticize Vince and his creative, but sure. This double turn at WrestleMania 13 is probably the gold standard. I don't think I've ever seen one done as well. Can you think of another? No, yeah. not on that level. Not with that, those kind of, those two talents. No, it was a piece of art and all the stars aligned and the, and Austin bought in with Brett and Brett's finish, you know, and Austin executed like a, like a master. So, uh, it was really, really good. Uh, I. I, I just think that Steve and, and Brett had this great chemistry all because Brett was willing to go out of his way and go the extra mile to validate stone cold. And like I said earlier, we'll never really fans don't talk about it enough, but we'll never really understand how big Brett Hart was and the development of stone cold, Steve Austin. It was huge. And, uh, it, it, it made the, it made stone cold's career. And we know how that worked out. He became, he sold more merch. He, he drew more big buy rates. He sold more tickets to live events than anybody in the company's history. Uh, so that's got to tell you that they were onto something good. And that, that Brett was the catalyst and making that happen for Steve. Let's, uh, also remind everybody that just a few weeks after losing a smile, it's announced that Shawn Michaels will indeed be ringside at WrestleMania for the main event with undertaker and Sid. And then on the go home edition of raw March 17th in Syracuse, we have a classic, uh, Brett and Sid cage match with the old big blue cage. And it's only classic for the promo afterwards where Brett just flips out and has a profanity laced speech here that maybe even gets them in a little bit of trouble. Um, with, with the network, 
He's going to shove down Vince, curse up a storm. It turns into a brawl and, and Sid is coming down the aisle and has one of the more classic lines of all time. Sid yells, I don't know shit, which is <laughs> kind of funny. Um, this is a calculated risk and, and you know, on the other side, just to add context to this, this is around the same time that Dennis Rodman is popping up for WCW and the NWO is just white hot. You guys are getting thumped in the ratings. You're sucking hind teat as it said. Oh my God. Hind teat. And at this point, Brett is probably, um, embracing this newfound heel stuff, but at the same time, it feels like Vince is, is hemorrhaging cash. I mean, we know just a handful of months after this, I guess, six months, maybe a little less is when Vince is going to come to Brett and say, Hey, I can't afford to keep you. Uh, so Vince is willing to take some more risks, but this outburst, uh, on live TV with, with, with Brett using foul language. Did you think this was the right call at this time? Yeah, it, it started the attitude era pretty yeah. st st strongly. And you don't, you're not used to hearing, uh, curse words in a wrestling ring from a, a wrestler with the esteem, credibility and respect that Bret Hart had and has, uh, so yeah, I, I thought it was. Could some of the language have been tempered? Yeah, of course, of course. But when you're doing something spontaneously without a script, you didn't memorize your lines. It was from your heart. This is how you felt. That's what uh, I think connected the audience to this whole damn thing is that in all, and all the bitching and moaning that Brett was doing as a character, people believed what he was telling them was truthful in, in Brett's point of view. So, uh, I, I thought it was, a. The, 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 again, censoring some of the language I would agree with, but how it was delivered and the res, how it resonated, uh, I have no doubt it was, it was a thing to do. So we know what happens at the Rosemont horizon, Brett and Steve put on a clinic together, something that I think will live up forever. You know, I mean, this is the gold standard for a submission match and of course, what's fun is, you know, stone cold had really been using the stunner. He was not really doing a lot of million dollar dream stuff. Like he debuted when he debuted with the WWF, but Brett has the, uh, the sharpshooter. We're going to have some blood. We've got a special guest referee and Ken Shamrock. It's a big double turn. It's a masterpiece. It's five stars, Jim. I don't think we can put into words how great this match is. If you've never seen it, I think you should climb out from under the rock you're living under and go watch it today. <laughs> yeah, I agree. It was, uh, the Bret Hart, Steve Austin match at WrestleMania 13 was as good a wrestling match as I think I ever called not my work just to be there at the right place at the right time and see these two masters uh, at work, uh, execute something that's very challenging to do. You know, a lot of young talents weren't even aware of the term double turn. They, they had never seen one, especially seen one as executed as well as this one was. But again, you go back to who, who created the Austin ex executed. Yeah. But Brett created. And because Austin's trust in Brett, uh, he felt like Brett, that, that this match was going the right way creatively and boy, did they deliver. It was his five stars, you know, hell in today's marketplace with with a using Melcher star system, that might've been one of those Kenny Omega numbers. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think this is the only five-star match that he ever gave Brett or Austin, uh, maybe the first one, the WWF ever had at this point, um, just go out of your way to watch it. It's a freaking masterpiece. We can't say enough nice things about it, but I do want to mention that same show. We saw WrestleMania 13 come out to do commentary, uh, for the big main event. And he comes out with a big entrance and then he even opens his jacket where Vince can't see him, uh, at the commentary table and flashes the click sign, which as it's been used on TV in that era, that was the NWO hand gesture. And, um, of course, Brett's going to come out and, and call Shawn Michaels, a pussy and a faker. And we know that we're ultimately <laughs> going to get things back on track, yeah. uh, but did you know at this point, okay. 
Sean's going to be coming back and maybe we'll do something with these guys at SummerSlam or what was the working idea at WrestleMania for Brett and Sean in the future, as best, you know, it was just a day-to-day -day process of, of, can they put their ill feelings aside long enough to go have a classic, uh, you hope that was going to happen. And cause we all knew Conrad that if Brett and Sean were in the same space mindset wise, that their match would be extraordinary and the stories that the announcers could tell based on what had already aired as far as the promos and the buildup and all that stuff, uh, just makes it a great backstory. It's really terrific in my view, but we didn't know. I'd like to tell you, oh yeah, we thought that by July shit, there's a day to day deal here, man. You just hope you, we keep those guys separated so that, uh, they didn't tear each other limb from limb and in, in, in catering, so to speak. Well, let's, uh, keep the train on the track because we know the next line on raw Brett's going to cut an epic heel promo that really cements the turn. He's focusing on Sean as the face of the upcoming program. Sean's going to come out and defend the fans. And, uh, he's going to say that, um, Brett, the Mark man takes his accomplishments way too seriously. And Sean challenges Brett to a love it or leave it. And, uh, Brett of course attacks and, and here we go. This sort of reset on the Monday after WrestleMania, which is historically the biggest Monday night raw of the year. This breathes new life into Brett Hart, the performer, in my opinion, like he's been this baby face for so long. And now that he gets to have a, as Bruce likes to say, a fresh paint of coat. This is a whole new <laughs> ball game for Brett. I really enjoy Bre Brett as a heel here in 97, more than any other time in my career. What say you, uh, it, like I said earlier, it gave him, it, it, it sharpened his edge. It sharpened his sword. It gave him another, uh, element to utilize in his promos and his entering stylings because his work never dissipated just because he was a quote unquote heel in America. Uh, there was no significant difference in how Brett presented himself in the ring. And, uh, again, I said, this at the very beginning of this, of this uh, podcast that, uh, you know, Brett was, uh, he was not going to disappoint you ever. Uh, and he got, he started liking the heel thing because it was different. It was fresh. It was something he had not done and, and veteran talents, especially, and Brett had had that over a decade run as the baby face, it is fresh and it did give him a fresh coat of paint, uh, uh or a fresh, uh, bottle of sauce. I don't know, but anyway, you know what I'm saying? It's just, he, he just, uh, it just, it, it, it gave him a new lease on life. It seemed to me like it, it rejuvenated. Him. Yeah. And, and I'm not, I hope that's a good word. And it wasn't like you, are you saying that Bret Hart phoned it in? No, no idiot. I'm not. I know you'd like for me to, because that's clicks for somebody, but shit. No, he, he just had, a, he got some new toys and hell nothing wrong with that, man. And he used them smartly and efficiently and successfully. And, and think about how long it had been since he had been healed, you know, how much he had grown as a performer, as a promo, et cetera, et cetera, as a ring general. It's like seven years after he had been a heel before. And, and that was as a tag team effort with Jimmy Hart. This is just a total, totally different dynamic. And I'm thankful we got to see this here the next week, Brett's going to interrupt Davy boy and Owen Hart, who are the current tag team champions, but they're fighting over the European title and he gets the, the gang back together and they form the Hart foundation and man, we're starting to see some magic on TV every week. I realize in this era. WCW is still handily winning the ratings, yeah, but creatively, it feels like we have, uh, we found our voice here. We're on the right track. And I love the pairing of Brett with Owen and Davey, especially in hindsight. Yeah. Cre you create two more stars yeah. to get that nice rub from Brett. And by the way, two stars that could go, you know, uh, let's not, you know, Owen in that era may have been overlooked by some fans because of the Brett's giant shadow, but Owen Hart was absolutely amazing. I'm so glad that we're going to do some things in AEW to honor Brett's legacy and the Hart 
family legacy. I think that's just great. Uh, he deserves his moment. Does does Owen Davy boy when motivated was as good as anybody we had. Yeah. You know, he really was, he was, he could do everything that you wanted somebody to do and he could fly, he could mat wrestle. Uh, he could, he was physical when he needed to be. So, uh, I, I liked the, the whole scenario. And the other thing about the Brett deal, Connie was that he, I'm not going to say he finally learned how to do a promo. Brett got the chance to do a promo that meant something. Yes. It wasn't a traditional baby face, you know, uh, heel dichotomy. Uh, it was just a scenario where, uh, Brett mastered. He thought that was his gimmick. It became him and he did a, an amazing job of pulling it off. I thought. Let's uh, also mention that later that night, Brett is scheduled to take on the intercontinental champion who at the time is Rocky Maivia. So he's not quite yet the rock. He's still struggling to get over and, and, and find his wrestling character, if you will. And Brett would write in his book that Hunter was insistent that Brett go over, but Brett rejected the idea and ultimately gives Rocky the win by DQ. And Brett would remark that even back then he saw how big of a star Rocky could be. Exactly. And you can see that relationship still today. Rock recently did a video honoring Brett for entering the Canadian walk of fame. Right. Um, how often did you as talent relations at the time, uh, talk to Brett about his opinion on talent in this era? Is that something that just came up or you would have a formal sit down or what have you? A uh, formal sit down was not my thing. Uh, but I, I went to, I went, there's a, there's a handful of guys that when I needed counsel, <coughs> pardon me, where I would say to myself, am I wrong on pushing this guy? Am I wrong and pushing him again in front of Vince? Is this going to work before I would sometimes before I would do that, uh, I would go to, and later on Austin was one, but in this era, uh, Brett and taker were two guys that I, I oftentimes had counsel with. What do you think of this guy? Has he got something, you know, can, can, could you work with him in a main event scenario? What does he or she need to do to become uh, a, a marketable main event talent? Somebody that you theoretically could work with to draw money and make more money. So that, that happened a lot, but it was never an orchestrated. Well, uh, take her, let's have a meeting at three o'clock on Thursday. And, yeah, none of that shit. He was just old school. He was Clint Eastwood, man. So when you, when you wanted a Clint Eastwood's opinion, you went to Clint Eastwood right straight away and, and you got in a private area where it was a private conversation and you discuss things of this nature, because I, see, people will say, well, you know, that's the cowboy bill Watts wouldn't agree with that. Probably not. But, the, but the issue is, is that times change athletes like today. Uh, became more sensitive to their surroundings and their bookings. And, uh, they wanted to have a hand in the, in the process. I've always said, Conrad, that if you got, I learned this from cowboy, cause I seen him sit in a meeting room or a, or a booking meeting with his, the heel he was working with, uh, and get their opinion, get their feedback. How do we extend our program? This thing's starting to work. I want, I was thinking maybe. We get six weeks out of it, but now I want to get to, to the Superdome in November type deal. And he talked to that talent about how we're going to get there. Cause it's going to mean somebody has got to bleed. Somebody has got to get, it's going to be physical. And so but taker and, and uh, Brett were two great sources of information for me and, uh, and, and knowledge. And I always, I'll always be indebted to those guys for that. Cause they, they were behind the scenes doing a great job of helping uh, talent relations, identify talents. And I'm sure if I go back and do the research, I'd probably see some guys on the roster that I would tell you, well, that was an, ins in that was a Bret Hart inspiration, or that was undertaker liking this guy. And so we went with it. We gave it a shot. And then if I got to vent in front of Vince and I was pitching something, I could tell him honestly, well, you know, Vince, I've already talked to Taker about this because I wanted his opinion. And I wanted him to feel a part of the, of the process. I was about to say, no idea is as good as it could be. If you don't involve the talents involved in this creative, 
And when they think they've got a hand in it, they got, they've contributed to it, then you got a better chance of succeeding. And so that's kind of how I approach that whole area. But, uh, back to the original point, uh, later on Austin, yes. And certainly Taker always and Brett always were great. They were, they were honest. They weren't ego. So egocentric that they didn't want anybody else to get a break. It wasn't all about them when they were talking about talents. And, uh, I, I like I said, I'll always, uh, be indebted for their counsel, quite frankly. So Brett next gets on this, uh, European or, or, or South African tour rather. And, uh, he's even going to hit up, uh, Kuwait. Sean Michaels is going to go on TV and cut what Brett refers to as a shoot interview. Sean talks about how Brett only came back to the company for the money. And what Brett is most pissed off about is that, uh, he does what he does with Vince holding the microphone. So I, I guess the, the thing is Brett feels like, Hey man, Sean wouldn't be just saying this with Vince holding the microphone, unless this was blessed by the company and maybe Brett feels a certain type of way about it. Do you think Sean went into business for himself with this promo? And did Brett have a right to be pissed at Sean or even Vince here? Do you need to run everything past each other when you know that this is a contentious circumstance or what do you remember of all this? Well, we kept getting, we kept putting them back together in uncomfortable situations. We didn't solve any problems, Conrad. Yeah. We addressed the shit out of them almost every day. It seemed like, well, I got a call from uh, Sean today, JR, come on over. So I'd wander my fat ass over to Vince's office and listen to the latest. And that happened regularly. So I just think that we kept identifying the issue between two of the greatest stars, you know, I'm not, ex not excluding Nate, uh, but he wasn't involved in that, that try that insanity. Uh, but you got what you're doing. You're dealing with two of the greatest stars in the world at that time by far. And, uh, we never saw those problems where we just, if we did, we didn't do a very good job of it, but, uh, and a lot of it was just ego. It was uh, Brett had an ego. There's no doubt. And Sean certainly had an ego as we know. So it was hard to get, uh, everybody happy. And, you know, Vince, just was not of the mindset to terribly upset the apple cart, but we kept prolonging the agony. And as we did, the problems did not, uh, fade away. They stayed right in front of our face. So the gist of this promo, uh, let me just read what Meltzer wrote. Sean Michaels did a 15 minute interview, which was pretty much a shoot interview. It was easily the best segment on either show, although it got murdered in the ratings and Michaels did a tremendous job of getting himself over as a baby face. He said he and Brett loathe each other, both in wrestling and in real life. He said that Brett didn't just turn bad guy. That Brett was always the bad guy that he used his parents, his sister, and his kids to get on TV. So he could make money. He said, if Brett could make a buck, he'd sell his mother. He said six years ago when he got the intercontinental title and Brett was the WWF champ, he was happy playing second fiddle to Brett, but when it was Brett's turn to play second fiddle. He kicked and scratched every inch of the way. He said, Brett took time off because he thought the WWF and Michaels would collapse while he was gone, but instead they had the best business they'd had in six years and asked McMahon if it was true. And McMahon agreed reality break folks. It goes without saying that in the ring, Michaels did a super job in 96 and he was my pick as wrestler of the year. However, let's not rewrite history to say Sean's reign was Hogan asked from a business standpoint, because nothing could be further from the truth. Television ratings collapsed in June of 96 on Sean's watch, not Brett's and the company reached all time lows for the rest of the year, but the buy rates fell through his reign. And it was during Sean's reign for the first time in a decade that the WWF and both pay-per-view and TV ratings failed to being the number two company in the United States. When it came to the house shows, while the WWF had a strong year in 96, its best months were February and March. And who was the champion at that point? Bret Hart. 
The summer was good, but there was a serious decline in the fall at which point, at which point Vince threw everything he could to get Brett to come back, including promising him the title belt. Let's not forget that there were numerous cases of Michaels throwing unprofessional hissy fits throughout his title reign in the ring. I guess people are trying to rewrite reality with Michael's reign as champion being this huge success, but that doesn't jive with the facts. And if it was the case, why did the WWF want to take the title off of him twice with Sid the second time ruining what they'd spent a year building in Brett versus Sean, if he'd been this Hogan like success from a business standpoint, Sean would continue to say that Hart used a rival organization to stab the WWF who made him in the back by upping the money that he could get. He said that Brett can't separate wrestling from real life. He's obsessed with the limelight and the title. And he used it to, uh, bo- it used to bother him when fans cheered Brett, but now he realizes fans can cheer for whoever they want. He said that all the superheroes and role models couldn't live up to it. And that he isn't claiming to be a role model, only that you pay him to see him wrestle and to work harder. And he'll give you as good of a show as anyone. So Sean is trying to be the sympathetic baby face, maybe taking some liberties with the truth and reality and Meltzer calls him on it, but I could see how Brett would take issue with this. If it wasn't discussed ahead of time, especially when he says, Hey, and we had our best years ever, right? Vince and Vince sort of co-signs it. I could see how that would be a burr under Brett's saddle. I'm sure you agree. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Numbers don't lie. Yeah. Numbers don't lie. So it's just, uh, again, that old massive egos in, within pro wrestling rearing their head again, you know? So yeah, I, if I had been Sean in, in hindsight, I would not have gone back to using that data. Yeah. It was not as successful a year as he envisioned it was. Uh, and God knows I'm well aware of that. Cause I was in meetings for the executive, uh, board executive, uh, group, uh, on a weekly basis. I knew where the numbers were and they weren't good. Hence we're trying to unload some contracts and, and cut back a little bit. So, uh, it, then again, ego, if egos could be eliminated and they can't, I understand that kids. If egos could be uh, eliminated, this would be even a greater business. But uh, I, I oftentimes can't understand why so many people uh, raise so much hell over fictitious titles. Yeah, it's a fucking prop. Yeah, and, and boy, I, and I'll get heat for that. No, you won't. Oh, yeah. You know, but and I don't care. It doesn't matter. Yeah. But bottom, but bottom line of it is, is that, uh, that's not the financial model you want to draw from if you're Sean. And of course he didn't know that Vince is, you know, sticking a toe in the water a little bit. And then, you know, so, but Vince knew that Sean was so, in, so sensitive and so fragile that, uh, you know, it was important for Sean to hear validation that he was doing good and you were doing good in the ring. He had had some great matches, but it wasn't good. It wasn't good enough to maintain that bottom line. So Brett gets hurt at the end of the Kuwaiti tour and he's going to require knee surgery. Uh, and, uh, it's figured out that Brett would work Steve at in your house, revenge, a taker. And then the next night on raw and one of the most infamous segments in 97, Austin's going to injure Brett's knee and put him on the shelf. And this is kind of fun because they involve an ambulance. And this is just still to this day, one of the best segments we ever saw on raw. And I think it really sets the tone for what's about to happen for the rest of the year with Austin. Who's now a baby face and Brett's a heel, but think about that. Our baby face is attacking an injured wounded man in an ambulance and the fans (laughs) just can't get enough. Right. Well, that was Austin's charm. Yeah. Uh, they, they love the defiant nature yeah, and society was moving more into the, the outspoken free speech, uh, nature of, uh, the presentation and, uh, that they want the more crazy, the more unpredictable and violent and aggressive that Austin could be, the more the people loved him. 
They bought more shirts. They bought more caps. They bought more foam fingers and bought more of everything because they were living vicariously through this dude called stone cold, Steve Austin. who was anti establishment. Uh, and you know, they, they couldn't get enough. So we found out we're not going to change that. You know, we're not going to say sticking to be more of traditional baby face. That would be a good way to get cussed. You know, not concussed, concussed, but cussed. Austin did not. Why would he even think about changing his presentation? That make that would be uh, that would be one of the craziest things that we've ever heard. Uh, much like my discussion with Steve and Vince about turning Steve Hill at WrestleMania 17, I said it's like John Wayne becoming a Nazi in a war movie. Ain't gonna happen in my book. And it happened because we owed it to Steve, as Vince said. I told that story. Yeah but it didn't work. And we all knew it didn't work. It wasn't going to work. Most of us knew, but nobody would say anything to Steve because they knew it was Steve's idea and Steve was beloved. And he, he was contributing a whole hell of a lot to the bottom line and all that good stuff. So, uh, I don't know, Connie, I think maybe, uh, I think sometimes there's sometimes our issues are overthought there. And some guys were so defiant or not defiant, but so hell bent on maintaining a baby face heel, uh, balance. And you didn't really have that in a traditional sense, obviously with Bret Hart and stone cold, like you said, you got a baby face who assaults a injured man in an ambulance. And in, in the old days that would never have occurred, but we had to do some different things. What we were doing was not working. Right. So. So I think this was, this a great, the best idea. I don't know if it was the best idea, but it's an idea that certainly got the people's attention and remember what our goal was. Our goal was to get Austin over more because we were on something hot. And, uh, and so I'll leave it at that, but, uh, Austin, again, the Brett Austin relationship was further enhanced by the angle in the ambulance. So looking back with Brett being hurt and the heart foundation coming around him, of course, we had Brian Pillman and Jim Neidhart to the mix. It feels like this perfect timing. I mean, Brett on crutches here and this gang surrounding him, it's almost like he's the godfather right. and it gives him a chance to not quote unquote, just wrestle because Brett, everybody knows is, is one of the best wrestlers in the world. When the bell rings, you're in for a treat. As long as Brett's on the card. Yep. But his promos in this era, man, he just stepped it up. I, I think we get to really focus on how strong of a promo Brett became when he's out injured here. Um, I love the presentation. I think this version of the heart foundation and, and, and even Brett on crushes with the mic work, it's great TV. Is it not? Yeah, it's great TV and, and it's fresh. It's different. I think that's what vet, that made Brett further and deeply uh, uh, get into the character. He finally had promos that he could do that were fun for him. And he also knew that he was doing a, a solid for Anvil, uh, and Brian, everybody. And, yeah. And Davey and, and, and Owen, that was a hell of a con. That's the hell of a faction right there, man. Yeah. The heart foundation was, uh, the new version was great. But I think Brett hung his hat on new material and loved the reactions that he was receiving uh, any great star. You ask flair, you ask any of these great, the greats, the reaction they're getting from the audience is generally all the motivation they need. If the audience has got an ass every 18 inches and, uh, for you and me it might not be quite 18, but so forth and so on. It is what it is. Uh, but when you got a full house or near a full house and you got them in the palm of your hand, there's no better feeling I'm told. So, uh, that's kind of where I was on that matter. I, I just think that Brett saw, I got new material. He got, he had a, he had a cause. He had a reason for being this way and it was fun for him. The, um, the plan moving forward is going to be king of the ring, Brett versus Sean. The observer is hopeful that that Sean will be back in the ring in May and Brett's going to rehab as fast as he can from his little minor knee deal. 
And then we're going to get this match in the ring in June. And Meltzer makes this observation. All this shoot stuff makes for fascinating TV for some people, but it's one thing if Brett and Sean are using it as ammo to sell tickets for an eventual match, but to do it that way and waste TV time, airing real stuff on a fake TV show is kind of unprofessional. Did you like when they started to peel back the curtain and, and, and have these type of promos like Sean had about, I was playing second fiddle to Brett and Brett held up the company for a ri- for, for a rival offer. And is that more of this peek behind oh. the curtain shades of gray, new attitude era, or at the time were you as excited about it and think mm, cowboy wouldn't have done this? Well, I know cowboy wouldn't have done that. He, he cowboy was going to be a K fake guy all the way through from start to finish. I, as a fan personally liked it. Yeah. It, because again, it added a new wrinkle, a new element, a new ingredient to the, to the, to the soup. We're making some delicious dish here. And we, and we discovered a new ingredient that we could add to it. They wouldn't kill it. It would only enhance it. And so, yeah, I, I kind of, I kind of enjoyed that, uh, the behind the scenes stuff because it was, I always believe, and I, I've said it here before many times, reality based pro wrestling is the best pro wrestling. It's not some title. It's not some shiny belt, the strap. Oh, well, I got to get the strap. Well. I got to make money. I don't care what I understand. You want this, you want the strap to add to your, to your, uh, resume. So in any event, Connie, I think that uh, it was time. That was to be my, my best. I sound like damn Daffy duck here. Uh, I, that's would be my, my theory is that it was time. It was time to do something different. Look, we're getting our ass beat for 83 weeks in a row. How many ass opens you got to take before you start changing your, your, your philosophy. Right. To, to, to me, that was a no brainer. So, uh, yeah, I, I thought it was time. I thought it was time to do something. I wasn't sure where that was going to go because it was unprecedented. Nobody had done it before, which is another reason I liked it. It was something new and fresh. So I want to mention, um, there's something in Brett's book that I've never asked you about, but Brett wrote that he talked to Vince about bringing Bruce Hart back. Did you ever hear about that? Any hypothetical scenarios well, where Bruce Hart comes back in 97 to be part of the fold? I, I, yeah. Uh, but all that was, is Brett trying to get a relative a job. Right. And, and I'm sure Bruce put a lot of pressure on Brett to find him work. I might be wrong on that deal. And I'm not, I'm not knocking Bruce Hart, but for whatever reason that preceded me, uh, there was, there was, uh, I would say Bruce was not a friend of the show. He wasn't a, you know, he wasn't a, a regular, so to speak. And I, I'm not saying he couldn't have helped us. I mean, I'm sure he could have. He's a, he's a fire plug. I mean, he's a, he's a lightning bolt. He had great charisma and, and but he'd burned some bridges there. From what I understand, I never had any issues with him because he didn't really ever, he came in spot here and spot there. Uh, but he had a lot of, uh, he had a lot of, uh, sizzle and I'm sure Brett was only trying to help his brother get a job. Brother's got children. He got a family and Brett was, I'm sure everybody in the family thought Brett could do anything in WWE because he was one of Vince's guys. So, but it was not a long thought out, serious debate about Bruce coming in or not. So now let's talk about where things all change here. May 12th, 1997. Of course, we know now it's going to be Bret Hart versus Shawn Michaels at King of the ring, but there are stipulations. The Hart foundation would have to be handcuffed to each other around ring post. And if Bret didn't beat Shawn in under 10 minutes, Bret would never wrestle in the United States again. And the Hart Foundation, now including Jim Neidhart, closed the show on Raw, cutting a promo on Shawn Michaels. It goes super long, and Brett misses his time cue, as Brett claims, and the show goes off the air without the planned finish of the show, which was supposed to be Shawn Michaels hitting a super kick on Brett in his wheelchair. Now, you're at ringside when all this is happening. 
what do you remember about the show going long or, or Brett going long and supposedly missing the cue? Because I know Sean is furious when it doesn't happen. What can you tell us? Uh, well, chaos, more civil unrest. It's a plan deal. You know, they're, they are out to get me, whoever the fuck they are. Uh, and Sean just didn't need that. He, he was already fragile. And, but I understand his, uh, ang angst without a doubt. And yeah, we were hearing it on a, on a headset. We we're counting us off the air. Yeah. You know, we're off the air in a minute. Yeah. Uh oh, whatever the quarter of the, the, the commands were, but yeah, we were counted out. We, we knew that we were running out of daylight here with time's over and we hadn't got to our piece of business that we had planned for. And, uh, I'm sure Sean took that personally and all that good stuff, but, uh, you know, I, I don't know what to say. I just, it was a human error. Brett went long, which put the heat on him and Sean blamed Brett for the angle at the end of the show, not happening live. And as we know, um, they're going to show that replay of what happened off the air, the super right. kick would air on superstars and shotgun, but still it leaves a bad taste in Sean's mouth. And we're not done one week later. They're doing a show, uh, Monday night raw here in mobile. And this is where we hear the now infamous sunny days comment. Boy, it, it, it's tit for tat with these two at this point. Is it not? Nothing's, uh, nothing's off limits. And that's where, uh, it, that's where it got too personal. It got too, uh, you know, it just didn't need to be in the conversation. That was very personal. Uh, and a lot of things were said that were very personal that needed did it, that did not need to be said to give so, context to what we're saying. Cause some of our listeners may be don't remember the segment. Well, uh, the, the rumor that Sean tried to perpetuate was the fact that Brett had a fling with Sonny and Brett's married with yeah, the wife be. and young kids watching at home. Right. And now his quote unquote wrestling opponent is perhaps stirring up drama in a real life scenario, right? And real life family. And it was not discussed ahead of time. And Brett even mentions in his book that you personally called him to apologize for Sean's behavior. Do you remember making that call? Yeah. Yeah. I try to be a responsible, uh, administrator, Connie. Yeah. And I had, and I, Brett and I have always had a good relationship because we've always been honest with each other. And that's something within our profession is not abundant honesty. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was a conversation I felt I need to have. Uh, I didn't, I, I wanted Brett to know that we're paying attention, but there's only so much some of us could do. And yeah, so that was a, I'm glad I had that conversation with him. I think that helps solidify our relationship even more as time has gone on. So Sean would write quote, I returned to the ring on May 25th and I couldn't wait to get back in the ring. I flew around all over the place, but on one of my best performances. Early on in the match, I did my backflip off the top and I did it for a very specific reason. I knew that everyone, including Brett was saying, I faked my knee injury to get out of putting him over at WrestleMania. I wanted to rub it in their face. Every time I heard rumors about me, I made sure to do something to stick it to the guys who were spreading them. Is Sean justified in, in feeling a certain type of way about guys talking about his real life health situation? Or is he being a brat and trying to, you know, as he admits, rub their noses in it? Yeah, there was some, there was some bratness involved. Uh, he just, he just couldn't get past the, uh, the controversy. And again, it comes right back to him and his ego. And that was hard to control. I mean, you get a, you get a guy that's, uh, that is good as Sean. That's what always perplexed me. Look. You're as good as anybody in the business, Sean, whether you're hurt or you're not hurt, you're as good as anybody in the business in the world. So why are you so fragile? And I think that that was some of Sean's inner circle always coming up with a story to fire Sean up, 
to upset the apple cart and make it challenging for the office and uh, totally unnecessary, totally unnecessary. So uh, Sean was just very, Sean was in a very tough spot right there. I mean, you know, you, the easy solution might've been, Hey, we're going to send you to a sports psychology and we're going to get somebody to, you can talk to, and you can vent, and you can express yourself to someone that's trained in this area of, uh, of maintenance, but we didn't do that in hindsight, a lot of good, a lot of things make sense in hindsight. So I think the, I just think that Sean was, I think there are others playing mind games with Sean without a doubt. And then you had agents, you know, Patterson loves Sean and, uh, but Patterson loved Brett. Yeah. He loved both. Yeah. So it put Patterson, the lead agent in a somewhat precarious position because, because Patterson didn't want to take sides. Don't blame him. He shouldn't have taken sides. He should have supported both guys with the respect that they deserved that they had earned. So, uh, but Sean was just, uh, he's in a real tough spot. I, I have a lot of compassion for him in that era because I don't know if he, would, he knew sometimes if he was, you know, winding his watch or scratching his ass, something was going on and I felt bad for him because sometimes you, I'd talk with Sean. And he, he really wanted to change more often than not. He really wanted to get all this stuff behind him so he could proceed with the wrestling business. Uh, I know he wanted that because it, so, some of those brief moments where he would confide or he was just being a one-on-one -on -one conversation with myself. You could tell that he wished things were different. You could tell that he wishes this was, all this shit wasn't happening, but he was so far down the rabbit hole. I don't think he quite knew how to get out of it. Well, June 2nd is the first time Brett ever hears of the financial issues that the company's going under. Vince sort of lays that out to him. And we know that's going to rear its ugly head again in September. And that's where things start to really get sideways. You were very aware of the company's financial state in this era. I took a big pay cut 50 grand a year. So yeah, the, the, the I, I, so anyway, I says, well, are you sure the finances were as weak as were reported downright, I'm sure, because it, it affected me directly. And when Vince brought me into the office and said, you know, we're losing money here on the, and on, on, on the wrestling side, he asked Bruce to tell you the same story. He got, he got, he got, uh, his pay, uh, reduced. I got my pay reduced. I'm sure. I think that's what got drove JJ Dillon out as he called he, Vince, he, all the wrestling people whoever that was, uh, were individuals that had to pay the price first. Right. And, uh, and we did. So I don't know. I I'm, uh, it's one of those ongoing, never ending stories of chaos, jealousy, mistrust. It was exactly everything that in my world I didn't want. Because the, the store, the problems never end. You had the regular problems of travel and <clears throat> payoffs, and booking and who's going over and all this other shit er, that you deal with every single day in that role. But man, I never, I never, I never, I never got so immersed in this, uh, cesspool of shit as, uh, as I could ever imagine. And I didn't like it. Nobody liked it. I, I guarantee you, know, Bruce will tell you the truth is that none of us were having fun, right? But we had jobs and we were wrestling people. So what else are you going to do with that great degree you got in wrestling? Well, you're going to do the best you can to keep your job and contribute and dig ourselves out of this hole. Well, we know what's coming next on the heels of learning. Hey man, the company's in some financial straits. It's the backstage fight. Things bubble over in real life. There's no cameras here for Sean and Brett. Uh, here's what Brett or here's what Sean wrote about this in his book. By the time I wrestled in the tag match, Brett and I had nearly reached the breaking point. He had said bad things about my folks and apologized, but now he had gone on to stir things up by telling the dirt sheets and others that I faked my injury and retired before WrestleMania in order to avoid putting him over. 
On June 9th, we had a television taping in Hartford. I was in the dressing room when he came to me and said, I just want to say, and I cut him off before he could finish. Don't talk to me. You haven't said a word to me for three weeks. If you can't talk to me for three weeks, I don't want to talk to you now. I don't think Brett was used to people talking to him like that. About five minutes later, I was turning around to get some gear out of my bag and I felt somebody push me from behind. I turned around and Brett asked, what's your fucking problem? You, I yelled. He tried to punch me, but I peeled back and he missed. He pushed me again, but this time I stood up. He swung again and missed. And the next thing I knew he went for a double leg dive. I caught him around the upper body and we went straight back through a piece of paneling. Yep. We had each other in front face locks when Pat Patterson and Davy boy came over and grabbed us. Pat was yelling, come on, you guys. I let go and Brett yanked a hair full, a handful of hair out of my head that hurt like heck, but I didn't retaliate. The fight was over. I went storming into Vince's office and I told him I'm out of here. This is bullshit. I saw Aldo Montoya who later wrestled here as just incredible and asked him to give me a ride back to my hotel. He wasn't working that night. So he took me, I missed the show and flew home the next day. Vince sent my lawyer, Skip McCormick, who I'd hired when I found out about Brett's contract, a letter stating that I'd violated my contract. Skip responded by writing a letter claiming the WWE had failed to provide a safe working environment. Heard that one plenty of times. And Skip told me they were trying to blame everything on me, but once he wrote the letter back and uh, it would be back in their lap and they would have to ask me to come back. And that's exactly what happened. Now here's from Brett's perspective. Here's what Brett wrote at about 6 PM. I went into the bathroom to gel my hair before going across the hall to tape interviews. I was surprised to see Sean's reflection go by me in the mirror. I could see he was uptight. So I smiled and casually said, Hey, Sean. And he cut me off. Fuck you. You haven't talked to me for over a fucking month. What makes you think I'm going to talk to you now? Oh. Even though I had hair gel all over my hands, I was primed to go back to my original plan. But Sean vanished through the doorway past crush. who was lacing up his boots and heard the whole thing. I set out to find Sean, but he was gone. I paced around the backstage area until Owen, Davy, Jim, and Pillman came to find me quote. I know Sean's watching from somewhere waiting on me to leave this room. I'll bet you the second I walk <laughs> out of here, he'll walk in. All the stuff is in here. Watch. I crossed the hall, walked into the interview room and cracked open the door to peek back into the hall. Sean strode past me into the dressing room. He was bent over fixing his boots when I marched straight up to him and I pushed him to his feet. You got something to say to me? And he flicked a weak punch at me and missed balancing awkwardly on my good leg. I popped him on the chin, rocking him on his heels. He came for me. So I grabbed him by his long mane and pretended I was going to do a hammer throw with the Olympics. I was dragging <laughs> him around the room when a hysterical Pat and frantic Lawler ran in and jumped on top of me. Unable to pry me off, Pout shouted for the other wrestlers to help, but Davey and Crush had no intention of saving Sean. It was nothing but a scratch fight, really, but when we were finally separated, clumps of Sean's precious hair fell from my hands. That's a fact, man. I was in there too, uh, and that was a, of all the things that happened. The most significant memory I have, as weird as it probably sounds, is, is it looked like uh, uh, the mad barber that had, uh, had taken advantage of Sean because there was hair everywhere. And, uh, it was just so childish. You're pulling fucking hair. Really? Brett would write Sean looked, uh, I blasted him quote. Don't fuck with me or my family. You little fucker. And Sean looked ready to burst into tears as he stomped across the hall to Vince's office, shouting loud enough for everyone to hear Sean quit saying it was an unsafe working environment. Then he stormed off slamming doors behind him. And Vince looked like a jilted lover whose boy toy had up and left him. He <laughs> told me that this had not only been inevitable, but was long overdue. And it was his fault for not dealing with Sean sooner. He told me to take the night off though. So this has been a long time coming. And, and as Vince said, probably destined to happen. Who's in the right, who's in the wrong here from an administrator perspective? Well, well, I don't know if there's a right or wrong of these two guys. Yeah. They, they both wanted a confrontation. It seemed like that was planned. It wasn't planned, but it seemed like it was planned the way it all played out. 
I don't know how you can say who was, uh, who was right or who was wrong. They were both wrong. You don't do that kind of shit at work. You just don't, it's not the goddamn wild west. And if it is the wild west and you're going to have a, a fight, the fight cannot be based on hair pulling. Yeah. So I don't know how you cast judgment on either guy, but man, oh man, uh, it was just, and it was a talk. Look, it upset the lock, the locker room. It's like you're a good example. When, when he said that, uh, Davey and crush, were not going to let Sean do whatever. Uh, and that's what happened throughout the locker room. You had guys that were Sean's people, but you have more guys that were Brett's people. That tells you a lot. I'm not telling you that they were right. I'm just telling you that Sean had more, uh, as political asylum, uh, in that world than, than, than Brett did or than Sean did. And I know that bothered Sean as well. You know, I, I want to be loved too. I want to be respected like Bret Hart. Well, then you got to earn it and quit bitching and crying and moaning. And now you got your hair pulled and you got, you know, God, come on. So I don't know how you could identify guilt, Connie, quite frankly, I'm not avoiding your question. I guess I am, but I don't yeah. know the answer to it. Let my family save your family some cash. You don't need perfect credit. You don't need money out of your pocket, but we will save you money. It's not a matter if it's a matter of how much save with conrad.com I, I think they're both wrong it, it was a bad deal but we hope that today's episode was a good deal for you we're gonna bring it to a close here because we can't tell this story without going knee deep into the montreal screw job so we're gonna revisit that later in the year of course this is gonna be the 25th anniversary of that moment and we'll pick mm-hmm. it up from the fist fight the backstage fight <clears throat> all the way through the end of november uh, when we touch base again here about this topic, but what an interesting time for the WWF for Shawn Michaels and for Bret Hart. And, um, I think when, when, when history tells the story and maybe we are right now, when we're talking about it, this is maybe Bret Hart's most memorable year in his entire career. Yeah. And a lot of people are going to interpret what we said in their own, in their own, by their own ear. Sure. You know, I think that both guys deserve better. They had made great contributions to the wrestling business. They were both very talented. Uh, you know, you, you dream as a booker to have two guys like that on your roster. And then when all the personal shit and all those, uh, those issues fed into it, it was just, uh, it was very sad because they both had earned the right. You know, I, I'm with Sean Michael since he got booked by Jose Lothario in mid South wrestling, his first territory. You know, I, I became friendly with Brett in 93 when he and I were, uh, I was first went to work at the WWF. So they both deserve better, a better outcome than the bullshit they put everybody through. And they more importantly, put themselves through, it was much to do about, I don't want to say nothing because it was about something, but, but again, I go back to the same old thing. We have to have better communication. Yes. And, uh, you know, I'm not around WWE now at all. Uh, I, I wish they do well. I don't dislike them whatsoever, but I know that, uh, I haven't seen anything like that in AEW. Thank I'm you. sure there's hurt for, yeah, really. And I think, and Tony Khan, not being a quote unquote wrestling guy and the old school and all, you know, tough guy and all that he's, uh, we don't experience that where I work. And it, it makes going to work fun and going to work then in that era, because those two great stars did not make it fun. Well, let's, uh, let's mention what we're going to be talking about next week, because I do think it will be fun. We're talking about the first time that I remember that the WWF ran the sky dome, uh, for a Monday night raw and what a big show it was. It went down or it aired rather, uh, on February. Uh, I think it's third, but boy, it was taped a few days ahead of time in front of 25,628 fans. The gate here for this television show is $324,326. This is at a time when it feels like 
WCW is playing catch up or, or the WWF is playing catch up ball to WCW, yeah. but you've got 25,000 fans here. And, uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff on the card. Uh, you're going to see Vader working with stone cold, Steve Austin, Savio Vega, working with flash funk, Owen and Davey taking on furnace and LaFon. talk about some workers, uh, crushing gold dust Hunter Hearst Helmsley and Mark Mero. And then our main event is the undertaker and Ahmed Johnson taking on mankind and Farouk. But this show looks different than any other WWF show you've probably ever seen. Meltzer would say the sky dome was poorly lit. The crowd wasn't well mic'd, and most of the matches were disappointments. It came off like a dead show, according to Meltzer, but there's 25,000 fans there. Jim and I are going to watch it together next week. Hope you'll join us here on grilling Jr. And I uh, hope that you uh, enjoyed dynamite last night. Vince is, uh, no longer Jr's boss. Tony Khan is, and Tony Khan still believes that Jim Ross is the voice of wrestling. And we do too. <laughs> so here him every single Wednesday night. And don't forget tomorrow night, we've got another big show coming up. It's going to be rampage from AEW. Yeah. Uh, and this Saturday it's the Royal rumble. I'm picking big E and Ronda Rousey. I don't even know if that's possible, <laughs> but, I, but I'm hoping that you guys will join us in St. Louis. It's uh, Eric and Jeff live.com. We got a fun little super show coming up, but I don't know that I've told you this, Jim, but the Airbnb we rented, I made sure it had a gas grill. You can actually narrow it down by amenities. So I'm taking a grill. Or, or, or I'm taking some grilling seasoning and you know where I went. I went to jrsbbq.com. out of boy. I'm proud of you. I, I, I'm proud of you. And I, I know our business even after Christmas has held up very well. Uh, we've always got some deals, steals and deals. Uh, and, uh, I just got a text message a few hours ago about this, the, uh, hot sauce. That's uh, I, I, I quit living my life on when the goddamn hot sauce is going to be ready. Uh, <laughs> well, you, you find out when you're creating food products, it's a million imaginations. Yeah. You know, uh, you gotta be smart. You gotta be, they got a set of rules and they got laws that govern all this stuff, which is good it's for safety, the safety of the consumer. So, uh, we're going to be adding some new elements and some new items to our site. JRSBBQ.com is where we are. Cost nothing to, 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 to shop, to listen, to look. And, uh, we just appreciate everybody's support because it's just a wrestling family doing business with other wrestling families. And I, I, uh, I know that sounds poly and ish and so forth, but I, that's what I believe. I believe that fans are hitting our site because they respect what we do. They respect what I've done. And, uh, and I just, I'm just very blessed. So, uh, as I get healthier and I can walk better and I'm moving around better, uh, I'm very, very proud that we have built a little business that my mother and my late wife, Jan would have been very proud of. And that's all because of you folks. So it, it all, every, if you buy one bottle of sauce, it means something. And we appreciate you very, very much. Check it out. If you haven't already, jrsbbq.com and uh, boy, we'd love to have your support. If you're digging what we're doing here, hit the subscribe button. It's free and be sure to tell your friends about this and our YouTube channel. Uh, it's grilling Jr on youtube.com, but more importantly, you get all of our shows early and ad free, including all the nostalgia you can shake a stick at over at adfreeshows.com. You can actually do a watch along with Jim and watch some old UWF stuff. You can be interactive with Jim and ask him anything you want on a zoom. You can't even do that at a Jim Ross meet and greet. There's 200 dudes standing behind you autograph, move on. You get to have a real conversation <laughs> here with adfreeshows.com. And, uh, I still think it's maybe the best value around just last week, Jim, we had the nature boy himself do a watch along on yeah. zoom and fans were awesome. asking questions. Yeah. Heard it was, heard it was really awesome. <laughs> and, uh, I heard Nate had a good time. He did. So to me, that's the win. I don't have many people were in the audience. I don't have as many generators done in my business. Uh, but I am really happy that Nate had a good experience because when I saw that it was all these fans surrounding him, I think, well, this is going to go one or two ways. You know, somebody's going to say, somebody says the wrong thing to flip the switch on Nate, then this thing's going to get out of hand. But he loved it. He seemed like he had a lot of fun. The fans obviously had a lot of fun. So uh I look forward to more Ric Flair Zoom appearances on the ad free network. 
Me too, man. It's going to be a fun year. We've got a lot of fun stuff planned, including some new shows, some new series, some new interviews, something for everybody. It's adfreeshows.com, and we hope everybody will be joining us next week as we watch a very special Raw from the Sky Dome in early 1997, the biggest Raw ever at that point. And, uh, of course, later this year, we'll pick it up where we left off and talk about how Bret Hart's 1997 finished. And uh, it doesn't end with a fight with Shawn Michaels, but it does end with a fight backstage, and we'll be talking about it later this year. This was a fun topic today, Jim. I appreciate you taking time to join us today. for this. Oh, yeah. Well, it's kind of my obligation, Conrad. <laughs> it's called gr- grilling JR. He said JR on it somewhere. Uh, I appreciate it, Connie. It's good. You guys do a great job. The notes are good, really good. And it, it refreshed my memory on a lot of things and, and brought back a lot of emotions. Cause it, I'll, I'll tell you that in all my years, I started wrestling in 74 and yeah, I'm old, I'm 70. Uh, but I'm still full of piss and vinegar and having a blast. Uh, but I, I, that was the most challenging time that I ever had in pro wrestling. And I've been fired a few times. I, I, I open my mouth sometimes when it should be shut, but, uh, nonetheless, I'm a, I'm a little bit, uh, I don't know what, how you'd say, but I, I, it brought back so many vivid memories. I hope the fans enjoyed the same thing. And as we continue to look at Brits last year in WWE going forward down the road. I think you're going to be even more intrigued by what you hear and what you learn. Stay tuned, boys and girls. It's going to be fun. Can't wait to be back next week on a brand new episode of Grill and JR with the voice of wrestling, Mr. Jim Ross. Heavy on the Mr. That's all I got to say. Thanks, man. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And go save yourself some money right now. If you're in a 30-year loan or you have credit card debt, it's not a matter of if I can save you money. It's a matter of how much. Find out right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com.